this was a completely new universe that we were developing from the ground up in terms of like, what is the look of this world? They have such a colorful box of crayons to, to paint this world. And when it comes to space, they can do so many amazing things to suck you into the universe. The world of Lightyear is tactile. It's a little gritty and dark. Everything about the movie is centered around how Buzz interacts with the world. I will explore further the oddities of this strange planet. As with all of the elements in the film, I wanted to be geared around there being real life and death stakes for Buzz so that the audience has concern for him. There are no limits to what you design in it. As much as that's the cool part about it, that's also the intimidating part about it. This world, there isn't a note or bolt that isn't thought about in design. I don't know if that's Pixar's gift or Pixar's curse, but that's what we do. It's also exciting. It's a lengthy process and an artistic process and like, why? Why spend your time that way? And for us, why not? When we get the chance to work on a movie like this, like, you can't hold people back. The world of Lightyear is definitely not a place you'd think, I want to go there on vacation. There's no brochure that's going to help you sell this planet in a way that would seem appealing. It all looks very dangerous. The planet seems to want to kill anything on it. As story was evolving and, you know, there's early design going on and we're trying to figure out, like, is this a jungly, like, really overgrown planet? Is it completely, like, barren? So set dressing is putting all of the pieces together. Basically, when we start, we have a blank canvas. Set dressing is not just decorating a room, it's building an entire world. It's putting down an entire planet and trying to figure out what are the biosystems, what are the terrain features. Early in the film, when Buzz has landed on the planet and realizes this is not a safe space, we see these vines coming up and attacking not just him and his commander, but also our ship, the turnip. And in the process of these vines coming up out of the ground, they are cracking the ground into large chunks. We called them fudge biscuits. <laughs> the thinking was, how can we make this planet unpleasant so every day Buzz is reminded of his failures? Everyone's just stuck here because of me. It's a habitable planet, but it's not a nice planet. One of the things that was decided was it was going to be tidally locked. A tidally locked planet orbits around its sun, but it itself doesn't revolve. And so the face stays toward the sun. So fundamentally what it means is that there's a sunny side and a dark side. Tidally locked planet, if you could live on it, you would live in the twilight part of the planet. And that really drove a lot of the look of the movie because there isn't your day-night cycle. We used weather. Some days would be stormier looking, foggier looking. And so you're getting the scariest part of the film on the dark side. There's something more magical about it. There's the dark side of the planet. Early on, the concept art was primarily looking at different types of worlds. There was a lot of different ideas for how big the city on our planet was going to be. And then as the city gets built up, we've got these skyscrapers and stuff. We had a lot of concept art showing this kind of metropolis that had developed over hundreds of years with subways and cars going and bridges. And that obviously got jettisoned for a much smaller settlement feel. We realized that if it were a science mission, they were heading home. Starting out with, you know, 100 people, a bunch of scientists and a few people to, to facilitate the mission. Gives you the, the flexibility to just focus on buzz. We always went back to what was Star Command. How much of it is military? How much of it is civilian? How established and how developed it was? What would you need on an outpost on a foreign planet? Something that we kind of landed on early on in the film is this chunky aesthetic. We thought, like, okay, what are the, the two things we're going to see a lot is a hallway. Let's do a design pass with the Star Command, the Buzz Lightyear world, and do a, a hallway of the Zerg world. So we really focus on making those two read differently. That was a great base for us to start 
using that as like a shape language for our film. The colony being very rounded, everything having sort of a chunkiness and a thickness. And Star Command has to reuse things over and over. It started out as a smaller settlement that was made out of building blocks, kind of put these pieces together and build our, our kind of city. And so we kind of started by designing a lot of those sorts of things, doorways, wall panels, big girders. Everything was kind of broken down so that we could use and reuse. We were doing a bit more kit bashing than I think is typical for set dressing. The era we come from is like practical models and you know those kit bashers they were taking model kits breaking them apart and making a ship which is genius because you can you can make anything with those parts. We got Industrial Light and Magic and Lucasfilm to actually let us use their kit of parts so we got unique pieces from Industrial Light and Magic that they used to fill out their Star Wars world and so there's a little bit of Star Wars built into the world of Lightyear as well. And we wanted to really seat this in an everyday world for our characters. A lot of things are gonna to start to see a lot of wear and tear. They're gonna get weathered. It has a little bit of dings, has a little bit of dents, has a little bit of dirt, it has a little bit of use. It's meant to be this kind of retro future, like early 80s personal computing retro. So in that world, everything has a button. There's lots of storage disks and cartridges and everything nests together and uh, there's a lot of surface detail and it's a, you know, mixed with a little bit of Star Wars-y cruft. Let's, let's keep it moving. It's so crazy. <laughs> a small group of us got to go visit the Lucas Museum archives and see what the props looked like in person. What is that? I don't know. <laughs> Star Wars was foundational. It's what you think of when you think of like that, that grievel detail that makes everything look a little more high tech or a little, you know, more sci-fi. As a fan, it was really exciting and really a dream come true. It was also a nice kind of check-in to see what do the real things look like? How does it translate to screen and how might that inform us? Uh, so this is, uh, I just did the, uh, the last little bits you asked for. Mm -hmm. I did, uh, the we actually had a, a model builder build the first version of uh, the XL1 ship, you know, the way they used to do it in the old model shop, um, like at Lucas. <laughs> John Duncan built a lot of models, some of the Star Wars models. He, he's a practical model builder. Ended up being invaluable as far as developing the aesthetic of the film. It was just a general feeling of what is the right amount of complex detail to flat shapes and clean lines that has kind of informed the rest of the movie. Really gorgeous. Traveling at you know light speed, and we have uh, this ship that is you know needs to withstand all of these forces. Mm -hmm. I was like, I really wanted to play with something to kind of reinforce the solidity of it. the ship. Greg Peltz designed fifteen different spaceships to convey that idea of time passing. Where would the technology go? It get a little bit more kind of honed, you know, as they spend more time there and they get their own manufacturing you know processes set up things would start to evolve look-wise a little bit. And so if you actually look at the XL1 versus the XL15, and there are decades between these two ships, and the XL1 is a very, like, slapped together, expedient-looking ship with lots of rough edges, and then the XL15 is a very, like, smooth, cutting edge of technology at that point later in the movie. At the biggest level, they would go from bigger to smaller. They would go from unrefined to sleek. With our ships, when we get up close to this, like we'd want it to feel like it was all put together and have seam lines and all this cool detail that makes it feel large and physical and built. Knowing that we're making a fantasy movie, you know, that sci-fi, it's like you kind of want to like draw as much, you know, from the real stuff as possible. We went to Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas together. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing the NASA stuff where you like sit inside the cockpit of the space shuttle. It's a world that feels like it was built by hand. We can't put that much stuff in there because like in a cartoon world, like Buzz's hands and fingers are huge. All the buttons and the dials need to be able to fit him. So everything needs to be scaled up and kind of stylized. But at the same time, you want it to feel like there's a lot going on. Like this is a complicated machine that he has to be a, an expert to be able to fly this thing. Ivan, pull up the flight plan, please. The buttons in the XL1 
was probably the best example of all departments kind of working together on one problem. The buttons were painstakingly designed by the art department. How many buttons? What shape are they? What color do they need to be? And so the assembly line process begins. It then goes to the sets team where they will add the models of those buttons. Then on to the character department to rig it so that the animators could then activate the buttons, push them on and off, went to our look dev department for them to set up the materials. When a button is lit up, it looks as if there's a, a light bulb behind it, but there isn't. We are shading the outside of the button to imply that there's actually a light bulb behind it. Which also tied to our lighting, reflecting those lights in the visor of his helmet. Angus believes that even if something isn't the focus of attention, if you build it tactily, for lack of a better word, it all creates an impression. So that need to build it as if it were real became important in terms of the texture of the film so that you really feel it. One of the things I'm really excited about is industrial design, mechanical design. My father's an engineer and a sculptor, and I, I, I really like manufactured fancy stuff like spacesuits. There's a certain gesture in a spacesuit of soft goods to metal material that you can gesture to get across you know, something that, that looks legitimate. When a spacesuit looks real, it implies risk. What I love about this is like your amount of detail and the, the readability of big to small and the chunk of all of it really has this like sense of tactileness that we're going for the film. So it was really important for us that these spacesuits look like something that would keep a person alive in the vacuum of space. And part of really selling that is having the mix of soft and hard surface pieces. When I look at sort of like the hard details here, um, when I imagine wearing this, I think of wanting them in a place where I'm not gonna bunch and rotate. We were really lucky to get access to a replica suit. And I got to put it on. What was really cool about putting on the suit and like moving around in it is just how much you really experience that level of structure and layers. This suit is basically like a small, flexible ship. Like, how many times do you get to build a digital spacesuit in your life? Like, if you're lucky, one. It's a lot of hard work on this show, but the costumes are also really, really exciting because we don't get to do this every day, and it's pretty cool. Part of being a director is recognizing people's fascinations and, and indulging them as best you can for what's appropriate for the movie, because I know I certainly have the set of them. The best of what this film was for me was different groups of people nerding out about different things. Drawing on paper, going, oh yeah, let's let's put a spaceship, let's give it lasers, and no, 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 let's do this, and the kind of yes and collaboration. The attention to detail that we all labored over and that Angus was really keen on made the film rich and believable and immersive. Although that planet looks foreboding, man, there's some real beauty in what we're seeing, an excitement about it. So we designed all of this? And yeah, this project looks really hard, and this looks like a lot of work, but we can do this because we get to do this together. I know a lot of us, we had no idea how we were going to do it. It was terrifying. <laughs> we were like, there's no way we can't do this. And I am so happy I was wrong.